Hey guys, I'm Anar Mohawash, and thank you for joining me again for another episode of Mint Press News is Behind the Headline. Now whether it's current events or ancient history, the media is our lens for learning about the world around us. But never has this lens been more narrow, more sensational, more manipulative, and more extreme than it is today. The corporate media went from being owned by over 50 corporations in the 1980s to just six by 2001. These six corporations, which now make up General Electric, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, and CBS, now control over 90% of what Americans see, hear, and read. Now, it begs the question why some stories like ISIS, Iran's non-existent nuclear weapons, Donald Trump's racist rants and raves, and those cute cat videos choke up the airwaves while other real important stories completely go under the radar like the war on whistleblowers, NATO and U.S. military expansion surrounding Russia and China, the acidification of our oceans, big ag's genocide of the bees, government violations of our constitution, and possibly one of the most overlooked stories, that over 60% of the world's wealth is now in the hands of the 1% elite. Through this process of media consolidation and corporate ownership, the entities the press is meant to hold accountable became the very owners of the media. These media corporations spend billions to craft stories that distract, fearmonger, entertain, and propagandize rather than inform. They've effectively turned the media into a lapdog for those in power, dulling the teeth of the watchdog the First Amendment was written to protect. And Americans are catching on to this illusion of a free press. A 2014 Gallup poll showed that 60% of Americans don't even trust the media anymore, citing concerns about accuracy and fairness. Now let's be clear though, this isn't journalism. Journalism works in the interest of the public to educate and enlighten. At its best, journalism is a public service and acts as a watchdog against the abuses of power. Now, Project Censored is stepping in to fill in the gaps in corporate media reporting by drawing attention to what it calls the news that didn't make the news or censored stories. Each year, the largest student-led media organization in the country releases an in-depth list of the top 25 censored stories. Joining me to talk about some of the top censored stories so far this year in a book called Censored 2016 is Project Censored director Mickey Huff. Check it out. So thank you so much, Mickey, for joining me today. Um, you know, first I'd like to talk about your number one censored story, which is that 1% of the global population own more wealth than the rest of the 99% combined. You cite in your book that the policies that were established and maintained by the power elite and wealthy individuals whose strong influence keeps the status quo rigged in their favor. How do they do this and why is this so significant? Well, uh, Manar, thanks so much for having me on and for having Project Censored on um, in Press News. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, this, this story this year was from an Oxfam report. Um, you know, there's been a series decades long of ushering in uh, global neoliberalism. Um, often euphemistically referred to as globalization, which kind of tends to have a sort of a catch-all, rising tides, raise all boats, you know, kind of assumption or implication to it. Unfortunately, the data strongly suggests that that's far from the truth. And uh, in Europe, we've seen austerity waves uh, really crush the working class and uh, really gut entitlement programs, certainly in the United States. We've seen a four-decade uh, kind of trend of working people's wages stagnate or decline by 5% when adjusted for inflation, while the CEO culture's uh, incomes have increased by over 300%. Um, so we are actually now living in an era, uh, and looking right now specifically at the U.S., and then we'll get back to the globe. Um, but in the U.S., we're really uh, in a new gilded age where wealth inequality between the top and the bottom of the society has surpassed the late 19th century in the so-called era of robber barons. 
That's why this Oxfam report was really important, we think, and the Guardian of London covered it, and of course Oxfam published the, you know, the report uh, them, themselves. Um, you know, and if you start to look at the, the, the figures here, this was from January, and Oxfam, which is a nonprofit organization, um, they're talking about ways to eliminate poverty. So the, the interesting thing about this story isn't just that it's calling attention to this mass uh, inequality of wealth globally, it also is offering solutions, and I want to get get to a few of those here momentarily, um, but, but the report says that the 1% of the global population will own more wealth than the rest of the 99% combined by 2016. We've seen a massive growth of billionaires um, since 2009, the number has doubled, um, and, and again, when, when they have this, this, this program that Oxfam says in, in order to keep up with this and in order to kind of reverse that trend, they have something called even it up, time to end extreme poverty. And of course, we urge um, viewers to go to our website, projectcensored.org, because we link all of the independent news reports and nonprofit reports that we highlight every year that are vetted by our students around the, uh, the country and uh, fact-checked by professors and other community experts. And our purpose here not only is to call out the problems of censorship and underreported stories. Um, basically, we say censorship is anything that interferes with the free flow of information in a society that purports to have a free press system, like the United States, for example. But we also herald and celebrate intrepid independent journalists, and we want to give them all the credit for going out and covering the stories that others won't, like Larry Ellett, Ed Pilkington, the good people over at Oxfam. And again, they offer up what we refer to more as solutions journalism. How can we address global economic inequality? They have nine specific actions, and that's why I urge people to go and actually read these reports. Um, and, and one of them is simply make governments work for citizens really make the governments through representational uh, democracy address these issues, specifically promote women and economic equality, right? Women are over half the population, yet um, they often are at the receiving end of very negative social policies and, and political policies. Pay workers living wages, share tax burdens. Um, you know, and this, this is just some of the many things that are offered up here by Oxfam. And just quickly in, in conclusion, um, what else we do is when we look at these stories, how do we determine that these are censored or underreported? Well, in the United States, CNN, CBS, MSNBC, ABC, and Fox did cover the Oxfam report. But let me be very specific when and how. Um, they did cover it. So they do get to say, well, we covered that story, except um, that CNN covered it between 2 and 3 in the morning uh, at, at one time. MSNBC ran it between 1 and 4 a.m. Um, you know, ABC covered the story once after midnight. Uh, so these they're, they're covering these st stories so they can maybe be on their website buried somewhere, but they're being played when most people are not tuning into these programs at all. So it, on one hand, lets them say that they did cover something, but on the other, with absolutely you know, minimal effect. And given that the corporate news media uh, have interlocking directorates and uh, they get money from these advertisers, and they're, of course, profiting from not just the 1%, but 0.001%. They have an incentive not to call attention to mass inequality, uh, unless, of course, they're calling it class warfare from below. Well, speaking of the 1%, uh, something that we never hear about are the water wars taking place around the globe being waged by those same corporations like Goldman Sachs, uh, JP, Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and the Carlyle Group. Um, and other investment firms that are literally purchasing water rights from around the world at an unprecedented uh, you know, pace. Tell us more about the story and the problems with privatization of water. Well, Menard, this, this, you know, this is not a new story per se, but this is yet a current iteration of the so-called water wars in the 21st century. Um, and uh, Ellen Brown has written about this. We've seen this published over at Counterpunch, certainly Yes Magazine. Um, has covered this, and uh, this story was uh, researched by Ken Burroughs and uh, San Francisco State University students. Previous story helped vet it was helped vetted by uh, Andy Lee Roth, who's our associate director at Project Censored. And Andy really spends a lot of time on these validated independent news every, every year and really helps go through them and fact check them with us. So I just want to reiterate that, that we really go through these stories um, four or five different times, and they're voted on by 28 of our national judges. They, they don't just sort of slip through or they're not just stories that strike our fancy and then we throw them on a list somewhere. It's a very methodical kind of process. And again, we urge people to go to Project Sense, 
uh, projectcensored.org and learn more about the process. But this story on water wars, um, the, some people may remember back, back to Bolivia and the great uh, shutdown and protest there back in uh, 2000 or so when they were protesting Bechtel, uh, San Francisco company uh, that was privatizing the water. And, uh, you know, about 80 percent of the population there said, you're, you're not going to take take a com commons commodity like water that the people have a right to and privatize it and price hike it and, and, and make it unavailable. I mean, this has obvious negative net effects on the population, and it also is a way that pe populations can be further controlled. Um, well, I, I'm here in California, um, and of course, there's uh, water is off in the news here during the, the drought that's been going on for years here. Um, but there are, uh, are sort of an, a new corporate elite that are referred to as water barons. You mentioned Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Carlyle Group, and other investment firms. They're purchasing water rights from around the world at an unprecedented rate. Um, and in fact, in California, during the midst of this drought, while we not only have oil companies dumping fracking wastewater into aquifers and reservoirs, one of our other stories is this year, we we have Nestle, you know, privatizing and shipping water out of the state. You know, so there are many different levels and layers, you know, to the problem here of what we refer to as water grabbing. Um, and what's driving this new wave of water grabbing? Well, changing patterns in global food markets is one. Rising oil prices, concerns about uh, peak oil, the rise of agrofuels that use large amounts of water in the production cycle. These are things that are worrying the 1%. Um, global demand for new raw materials, um, again, mining projects. I mentioned fracking uses a great amount of water. Um, so this is, you know, using water for a lot of industrial or corporate prof for profit um, services that have little to do with everyday survival. And so this is something that we really need to focus on. And in this story also, I want to point out, Counterpunch in particular, uh, they call attention to 180 cases across 35 countries of remunicipalization. And that means that uh, there's a returning from private to public ownership of uh, water. Victoria Collier reports about this. And from Spain to Buenos Aires, uh, Coach, uh, Coach Abamba to Kazakhstan, Berlin, and Malaysia, water privatization is aggressively rejected. So it's similar to what we saw in Bolivia 15 years ago. And we certainly hope, for the sake of the public good, that remunicipalization is something that's going to be spreading much faster uh, than you know, the privatization movement. So this is, again, a real serious problem because, look, we all know no matter how much income one has, one needs water to survive. And even the Pentagon a number of years ago uh, stated that the wars of the 21st century likely won't be fought over oil. They'll be fought over water. And this water grab story, I think, is you know, further indication that that's actually happening already. And certainly the power is definitely in our hands if only most of the people knew like they did in Bolivia. Um, and a story that has made headlines um, in what I like to call the genocide of the bees. But we barely hear about why. Why uh, are the bees dying uh, at such a high rate? It seems like the media and major research institutions are dancing around the subject, but your number 11 censored story is that pesticide manufacturers are actually spending billions on a media PR response campaign um, into bee deaths. But the truth is, if the bees go, we go, just like with the water. What are we not being told about this story? Well, it's like there's a, it's, this is another story that's already widely obfuscated in the culture about what's happening with bees and is it cell phone Wi-Fi radiation? Is it pesticides? Is it climate change? You know, we've already seen those kinds of sort of stories, confusing, not able to put fingers on things. Um, but there's another layer to the story, and that's how a, a particularly pesticide corporations, companies, um, have been spending millions of dollars on public relations to sort of convince people that they're they're not to blame or at fault for these things. Uh, Friends of Earth did a lot of great stories on this. Certainly, uh, our friends at Center for Media Democracy in Wisconsin, PR Watch, uh, they've done some fantastic work on this story. This is another story vetted by San Francisco State University this year, working with us at Project Censored. And um, specifically, if you go back last year, Harvard studies uh, showed that uh, neo uh, neonicotinoids, uh, th this is uh, one of the, the things that's in, in these pesticides, 
they're actually shown to have significant harm to honeybee colonies. And as you said, you know, as the bees go, perhaps so do we. Uh, incredibly disturbing that these things are happening. And by the way, it's not just these and pesticides, but it's also glyphosate, right, and Roundup that's now been linked to many kind of health hazards. It's now been labeled as a carcinogen. Um, these are things, of course, that these, in, um, you know, uh, petrochemical companies, uh, big agro companies, uh, th that's very bad news for them. That's bad news for their products. And we're talking here, in, in this case, about uh, the honeybees. You know, companies like Monsanto, Bayer, Syngenta. Um, so, for example, they formed something called the Honeybee Advisory Council. You can imagine, like, a bunch of bees getting together over at the honeycomb and chatting. Um, but, I mean, it's again, it's completely Orwellian. Uh, basically, what they're saying is that the, there are bee-friendly insecticides. And, like I said, they're spending millions of dollars uh, trying to convince the public that they're not to blame for any of these things that are happening. Their products are safe. We've seen in case of glyphosate that some, you know, some of the executives or PR folks are saying it's safe to drink. Uh, and then, you know, some while. Wise, wise acre, you know, uh, interviewer will pull out a glass of it and they'll be like, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to drink that. Um, it's really a ridiculous kind of thing that we can imagine that these people are able to spin this information that we now know. We now are, are getting much clearer information that uh, these kinds of pesticides are not bee friendly. Uh, these chemicals and things that they're using in the pesticides are likely killing off bees. They might be linked to numerous of their health effects in humans and including uh, our likely carcinogens. So overall, you know, this is a terribly negative uh, story. And Syngenta was back in our last book, the 2015 book, where they were harassing one of their former workers and researcher at uh, UC Berkeley, trying to censor and silence his research, exposing their products as seriously harmful to the environment, seriously harmful to the ecosystem. And Menara, this means that it's a problem for all of us because we're part of the ecosystem. Of course, and speaking of the destruction of, the, of Mother Earth, um, the media does a very good job at painting um, the United States as a victim of terrorism and fighting wars abroad for human rights and democracy. But with over 300 military bases in over 153 countries, according to your book, um, the number 13 and 14 top censored stories touches on two things. And it has much to do with the environment because of uh, the military expansion, of course. The U.S. and NATO are aggressively encircling uh, China and Russia with expanding military bases and military defense systems literally targeted at those two nations. Um, and the second in that is that, that that forced global displacement has topped over 50 million people, the largest refugee crisis since World War II, um, all due to this military expansion. Uh, why isn't the media talking about this? Well, look, you're hitting right at the heart um, of, you know, Pax Americana, uh, global U.S. hegemony and control. Uh, and since the, uh, I, I might not call it the close of the Cold War, but more of a recess that we've seen uh, really reignited, particularly in the propaganda wars and rhetoric between the United States and, and Russia, vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Ukraine in particular, Syria, uh, uh, we've seen we've covered several of these stories over the years, including on our radio program. Um, but in the books, we've covered these stories. And um, there's really been uh, Bruce Gannon, for example, in our 13 story Pentagon and NATO and Circle Russia and China. This is from the Plymouth Institute for Peace Research. Um, you know, talk about this proliferation of U.S. bases. And, you know, the numbers vary in how people count these things. Some uh, analysts argue that there are over 900 military U.S. military bases in over 130 countries. Um, and, and, and again, this is designed to have a strong U.S. presence. NATO, of course, has really been behind much of what's been going on in um, Eastern Europe and in parts of the Middle East. And, um, you know, if you take a look at this, these strategies, th these are long time coming. After the collapse of the former Soviet Union, um, there was a great push. Um, you know, among neoconservatives, a rising group of, of really reactionary Republicans um, that were saying this is the chance that the United States now has to have full spectrum dominance, right? That was a Donald Rumsfeld kind, kind of term from back in the day, that this was the chance to push for U.S. global control. And Clinton kind of, I say kind of, uh, not 
fully, but kind of resisted some of, of that. And certainly not all of it. But he certainly resisted the urge to go in and topple the Taliban in Afghanistan, um, you know, trying to uh, eventually, it did install UNICAL uh, consultant Hamid Karzai there. Uh, <laughs> the, the, but uh, that was a feud over oil going to the Caspian Sea. But there were pushes there, and the neocons couldn't really get a, an in so much through the Clinton administration. But when George W. Bush was installed as president, notice the wording there, um, that basically opened the floodgates for the neoconservative movement, and particularly a group of people in the Project for New American Century, uh, the Kagan brothers, Bill Kristol, um, and a lot of these other people floating around all, all the way since Nixon, whether it was Cheney, Rumsfeld, later on Condoleezza Rice, etc., and they had this massive plan for global dominance, but they said absent some catalyzing and catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor, it would be un unlikely that the U.S. would really go for this kind of thing. Well, after 9-11, that's how that event was used, right, as this great, quote, opportunity, some cynicism there, but that does show that these people have a very strong interest in expanding U.S. power, expanding U.S. authority, sometimes it's done through U.N. Support. Sometimes it's done through NATO. Um, but look, we're talking about expanding into Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, right along the Russian border. We're talking about military buildup along uh, the coast of China, uh, possibly remilitarizing Japan. Uh, this is kind of what's been going on in the Middle East since 9-11, right, when we go into Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11. We're in Afghanistan that had very little, nothing to do with 9-11, certainly the people of Afghanistan, let alone the Taliban government who said, well, we don't know where Osama bin Laden is and we don't think he had anything to do with 9-11. Um, so we go and we invade these countries that have no connection really to the events of 9-11, but notice the geography. And of course, Americans are loath to really deal with geography, right? Uh, in fact, it's often said that, you know, warfare and foreign policy is Americans' way of learning geography, uh, sadly. Um, but take a look at what flank those countries flank Iran, and the United States has been, you know, really hostile toward Iran since the 1979 uh, uprising there that overthrew the U.S.-backed Shah that relates all the way back to the overthrow of the democratically elected Mossadegh. You know, it's a serious blowback event due to a CIA coup there, there in 1953. This goes back through the 20th century. That's, I think, why on one hand. Not only do you not see a lot of coverage in corporate news media, but it's because it's a deep historical narrative, and it really kind of uncovers a lot of the mythology that people want to kind of believe about U.S. foreign policy that is just completely countered by all the known facts and evidence, right? And so we'll see more of that in Story 14 as one of the results of this this mass you know U.S. push to encircle Russia, China, provoke confrontations there, control global resources, natural gas, oil. Uh, also in Iran, as we see the flanking there of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, we see uh, proliferation into Syria, into Libya. Uh, what's, what's one of the byproducts of all that, Minar? Massive refugees, right? Not only mass civilian death, and of course civilian death from drone strikes, which that's just another category, another iteration of this uh, that's still going on as we see in Yemen now and, and all, all elsewhere, you know, massive tragedies. Well, whenever people see refugees on the news, the corporate news media never really connect the dots. Like, well, where are these people coming from? What is this displacement? Why do we have this mass refugee crisis unseen since World War II? Much of it is because of U.S. NATO expansion. Much of it is because of the stoking of civil conflict and wars in places like Syria that the U.S. are responsible for significantly and seriously destabilizing. Um, and again, this is a, a serious global crisis and, of course, people in the Middle East are suffering directly. Uh, the neighboring countries are having to sort of deal and grapple with this. The United States is all the way across the ocean, right? So the United States rarely sees kind of a lot of the fallout of this. And since the corporate media are often very careful to disconnect U.S. foreign policy and the so-called war on terror into global humanitarian tragedies, uh, a lot of people are left sadly scratching their heads. And of course, the majority of those killed uh, have all been civilians, including in Pakistan, as one of your censored stories talks about, which is uh, drones, American drone strikes in Pakistan, where over 90 percent of the people killed have actually been innocent civilians, um, tragically. So it's, it's a very sad story. Um, but moving on to the final censored story, of course you have a lot of censored stories in the book, but we chose uh, about five or six to talk about, and I wish of course we could talk about more if we had more time. Um, but your number five censored story is about Fukushima, something we never hear about. 
Uh, even though it happened four years ago, the effects are ongoing and they've actually, um, have the, the crisis has actually deepened. Um, the media is not talking about the continued dumping of extremely radioactive cooling water into the Pacific Ocean that's, cre that's creating plutonium. Um, what does this mean uh, for not only our oceans, but our health and our future? Well, this is an incredibly uh, tra tragic story. It's, uh, uh, it also reminds me, I guess I'll show my age here, of uh, the old Blue Oyster cult song, Godzilla. You know, uh, history shows again and again how nature points out the folly of man. Um, we've long covered the dangers of nuclear power, not, not just nuclear weaponry and atomic weaponry, which is off the charts in terms of how dangerous it is. It is. Um, but, you know, there's this fairy tale that goes on that nuclear power is a safe alternative to fossil fuels. And uh, not only could nothing be further from the truth, but it's tragedies like what happened at Fukushima that, that really hammer home that this is a disaster that could be happening anywhere there's a nuclear power facility. In the United States, whether it's Vermont, New York, the coast of California, where we have multiple seriously aging nuclear power plants sitting on not one, but sometimes two fault lines. Um, you know, but again, uh, you know, get, so these things could be happening uh, here in the United States with you know one wrong movement. With the increase of fracking, earthquakes have increased at exp ex exponential rates. Um, but let me focus more of the attention here on Japan because that's really who's feeling the brunt of the tragedy of Fukushima. You know, j not long ago, just in the past weeks, we saw 82,000 meter bags of radioactive waste swept into the Pacific Ocean. There, we've been uh, seeing stories of, of just unabated dumping of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, fish that's been you know measured uh, for radiation and, and toxicity has shown that it has come all the way over to San Francisco, or there are high levels of radiation contamination in tuna and so forth. But again, the real people suffering this are in in Japan, right? Particularly people that are near the area where this took place. And uh, like you said, and like unfortunately, Fukushima has been in our book every year since this has happened. Um, there are a spate of unreported stories here. Um, you know, and TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, recently admitted that their facility has been releasing large quantities of water with tritium, uh, cesium, strontium uh, on a daily basis, right? Um, we also see here that uh, plutonium-239 is in this. And this, of course, will have global consequences. But again, let's go back into Japan, right? In May of 2015, earlier this year, the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Authority gave a final clearance to open up uh, nuclear power uh, companies again and nuclear power plants, despite the fact that there is overwhelming, uh, you know, uh, two-thirds of the public in Japan is opposed to returning to nuclear power. So we've done stories at Project Censored on our week weekly radio show particularly about ongoing contamination, contamination of farmland, the selling of contaminated food in Japanese markets in Tokyo. Um, and there have been a number of people, you know, really calling attention to this, particularly some of the elderly in Japan that have gone on marches, mothers that have marched across the country to raise awareness, people coming to Europe and the United States to give talks and tours on the dangers of nuclear energy and nuclear power and how this is an ongoing um, sort of mushrooming, uh, no pun intended for mushroom clouds, but mushrooming disaster that we're going to continue to see the effects from for decades, um, you know, likely eclipsing the, the catastrophe in Ukraine and Chernobyl years of decades ago. So again, um, we really urge people to pay more attention to what's happening with Fukushima. What are the long-term, you know, uh, damages of that for for uh, global consequences? But let's also go and take a look at how are there ways that we might be able to assist people suffering from direct effects of this in Japan and fu the future generations of people in Japan that will continue to sort of feel the tragic effects of radioactive contamination. And of course, uh, people can follow these stories by following independent media outlets like Project Censored uh, and Mint Press and you know, the, the other independent media outlets that you've mentioned in your book. So hopefully people will pick that up and check it out for all the censored stories of 2015. Uh, Mickey Huff, thank you so much for joining me and hopefully we'll have you on again. Thank you, Minar. Our new book is Censored 2016, Media oh, Freedom 2016. on the Line. We did with Associate Director Andy Lee Roth. We work with numerous colleges and students around the country, and our main effort is to really increase critical media literacy and to really create a next generation of strong citizen journalists. So we really appreciate what you're doing here at Mint Press News. And again, thank you, Minar, for the opportunity to come on and talk about Project Censored. Of course. Sounds like you guys are working in the, in the public's interest. Thank you. Thank you.